And so I want to begin with a paradox. Uh, when Darwin's theory was first published, everyone knew that if true, it would revolutionize our understanding of ourselves. And yet, by the early 20th century, evolution was largely restricted to the biological sciences and avoided for most human-related subjects. So why? Um, it's complex, and I only have an hour. Since I deal with people like Carola and uh, Paul Griffiths, I know good social historians that all social histories and intellectual histories are very complex. But two things stand out. One, of course, is the early use of evolution to justify social inequality. This became known as social Darwinism. And although anyone at the time could have said that these consequences do not necessarily follow from evolutionary theory, in fact, what happened was most people who wanted to distance themselves from these policies also distanced themselves from evolutionary theory, which became a, a pariah subject. And then a second factor, which I think is just as important, is a very common dichotomous way of thinking in which on the one hand we think of evolution along with biology, genetics, and genetic determinism over here in contrast to learning and culture over here as if evolution can explain our physical bodies and a few basic instincts but has nothing to say about our rich behavioral and cultural diversity. And I, and I think this is a, a kind of a polarized way of thinking which um, makes it possible to think that there's something outside the orbit of evolutionary theory which can explain uh, most, of the, uh, most of the human condition. And so as a result, we have a situation in which evolutionary science has grown sophisticated and has largely integrated the biological sciences, but like Sleeping Beauty took a nap for most of the 20th century and only has reawakened so that evolutionary theory has only started to expand and only within the last 15 or 20 years have we started to rethink the human-related disciplines from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And if that's not exciting, what is? Here's a very small sample of books. You name it, it's being studied from an evolutionary perspective. All branches of the human sciences, um, the humanities in addition to the so-called the human sciences, it is a very exciting time to be uh, an intellectual today. I feel privileged to be alive today um, as an evolutionist. Uh, but also what this creates is uh, what I like to call an extreme disequilibrium. This is going on and this is in progress at the level of research and scholarship. It is not fringe science. It is not future science. Open uh, the latest issue of science or nature and uh, you'll see this stuff. Uh, but not yet reflected in higher Education. The world around, if you're not a biology student, you won't learn much uh, evolution. Paul Griffith was just saying yesterday that uh, uh, if, if, you're not a, if, if you're not a biology major, you're almost certain to learn more about cubism than Darwin, more about Picasso than, than Darwin. Well, Picasso is a wonderful man, and uh, we have nothing against art, quite the contrary. But this just shows you the degree to which uh, to which uh, evolutionary theory is still confined to the biological sciences in higher uh, education, still less in public policy um, formulation. Now, in America, half of the populace claims to disbelieve in evolution. That is not true for Australia and most of the rest of the world. But I think the more discouraging statistic is that around the world, including Australia, when people think about evolution, they think about dinosaurs, fossils, human origins, they do not think about their everyday lives or what's in the uh, newspaper. And that's a worldwide uh, problem. And this disequilibrium is likely to persist for decades unless something is done. Professors like to think of themselves as free thinkers. But academic culture is amazingly conservative. And so unless something is done, the disciplinary boundaries are certain to exist uh, for um, decades. So we need to operate in catalytic mode in chemistry. Isn't it interesting that you could have a chemical reaction which is taking place very slowly or not at all, and you can add a tiny amount of a substance, and that causes the rate of the reaction to speed up, often by orders of magnitude, without using up that substance in the process. That's the concept of catalysis. And perhaps catalysis can operate for cultural processes in addition to chemical processes. And if so, we want to know about it. So over the last 10 years or so, I've been trying to operate in catalytic mode by going beyond my own personal research and building programs, basically, in addition to my personal research, 
For higher education, I started a campus-wide evolutionary studies program called EVOS, which expands evolution beyond the biological sciences, teaches it across the curriculum. That has expanded into a uh, nationwide and, uh, I think, uh, becoming a worldwide consortium. As soon as EVOS was strong at my university and we had people from all the disciplines speaking the common language of evolution, then we expanded it and we started to use our city as a field site, as an ecologist would think of a field site for ecological and evolution-based research on, moder on a modern human population. That's become known as the Binghamton Neighborhood Project. And then we started an evolutionary think tank, the first think tank that connects the world of evolutionary science to the world of public policy uh, formulation. All of these are very new, but they're all taking off very uh, gratifyingly. And I'm here in Australia in part to spread the word amongst my colleagues. We had a tremendous workshop uh, yesterday on some uh, how to get public policy issues going, and uh, it was very, very exciting uh, indeed. So I like to think of myself as uh, Dr. Evil here from the Austin Power movies, uh, changing the way that the planet thinks about evolution, and uh, I only need a million dollars to do it. So what I want to do today is just tell you a few stories from all of this, just to give you a flavor for some of the things that we're doing. Uh, first, I want to I um, articulate this idea of, of cultural, of human diversity as like biological diversity. I think this is very much in the spirit of, of Charles Birch, that we can think of human diversity as like an ecosystem, as like, as we're not just a single species, we're a single biological species, but in terms of the diversity of our behaviors and cultures, we're more like an ecosystem. And we can study the diversity of cultural systems as, as like um, uh, species diversity. And I want to illustrate that with a comparison of uh, liberal and conservative Protestant denominations. Liberals are dumbfounded by conservatives. Conservatives are dumbfounded by liberals. The liberal conservative distinction is orthogonal to the religious versus non-religious distinction. So we like, to, we like to think, what's the difference between a religious believer and a, and a secular believer? Well, whatever it is, it's orthogonal with the distinction between a liberal and a uh, conservative. So it'll be very interesting to think about these things. Then I want to talk about prosociality, basically other and society-oriented behaviors, as something that differs vastly among individuals, and how we can think about prosociality in the context of a, of a, uh, a human population such as a city. And this is very interesting because uh, a lot of research is telling us is prosociality is something that if you have it, you have multiple assets. And if you don't have it, you have multiple liabilities. And prosociality is also a famous puzzle in evolutionary theory. How is it possible that individuals that are other and society oriented, how can they win the Darwinian contest? If evolution is about having more surviving and reproducing better than anybody else, then how can a strategy in which you help others survive and reproduce, how can that spread by the process of natural selection? So we have a famous evolutionary puzzle, and we can take that and we combine that with something which we really want to exist in real-world human populations in order to solve our um, um, problems. And then I want to end, actually, on the same theme, but expanding the scale to see how these same uh, principles uh, can be used uh, more generally to think about evolution, economics, and public uh, policy. So let's return to this dichotomy between learning and culture on one hand and evolution, genetics, and biological uh, determinism on the other. And what we need to uh, replace it with is a, is a paradigm in which our open-ended capacity for uh, change is in the first place a product of genetic evolution. So we have to tell a genetic evolutionary story as to why our species has such a capacity for open-ended change. And given that we have that capacity, we have to see it as a fast-paced evolutionary process in its own right. Differ different than genetic evolution in its details, but still resulting in a diversity of forms which can be understood from an evolutionary perspective. And so what that does is it takes what seemed to be outside the orbit of evolutionary theory, and it brings it, it, brings it inside the orbit of evolutionary uh, theory. And so if you're an ecologist, you know that species can only be understood in relation to their environment. 
The same is true for human designed objects. And what I want to show you is that the same is true for something like a religious system and other kinds of cultural uh, systems. And so just to drive this home, here's a wonderful creature. Let's say that I gave this to you and I asked you to, explain, uh, to, uh, to uh, describe it and to study it without any reference to its environment. How would you go about doing it? And you would be tremendously ha handicapped if you were trying to explain this without knowing anything about its environment. This is not the best example because we know enough about this creature. We know it's a sea dragon. We know that it lives in the Sargasso Sea. And so we know that those amazing ornaments are, are to camouflage it against its natural uh, background. So we can't really do the thought experiment of explaining something like this without reference to um, its environment. Here's a uh, human implement. It's a kitchen gadget. Uh, how many of you know what this is? How many of you, you know for sure what it is? OK, some do. Don't say. <laughs> the others don't. Now, once again, uh, this is an imperfect thought experiment, because by virtue of the fact that it's a human implement, you know that it was designed for a purpose. Okay? But most of you don't know what that purpose is. And so if I ask you to describe it without knowing what its purpose is, you're going to have a tough time. Okay? So now I'm going to tell you what its purpose is, and you'll have an aha experience. Okay? It is an avocado slicer. <laughs> and now that you know its purpose, it is so much more interpretable than when you didn't know its purpose. OK. This is what functional design thinking is all about. OK, well, how about this? How about if I showed you this fellow and asked you to explain him and his beliefs without knowing anything about the relationship between his belief system and his environment? This is a Jain, an ascetic Jain. The Jain religion is over 2,000 years old, about 3% of the population of India. And to look at him, you'd be, you'd, you'd, for sure you'd think he had a disease. And so you know Richard Dawkins, my colleagues, is famous for, for basically thinking of religion as like a cultural parasite, something that infects you and wastes you, something which is good for itself, spreads like a disease organism because it's infective, but not good for individuals or groups. Doesn't it seem that this is a good candidate for a religion as a... Um, a disease. Uh, well, perhaps until you learn more about the religion. And then what you learn is that the Jain religion, uh, this is the, the, the ascetic Jains are a tiny fraction of the, of, the, uh, of the religious community whose lay members are among the wealthiest merchants in uh, India. The Jains are a middleman merchant society, and culturally they are convergent with the Jews in Western Europe, with the Chinese in Southeast. Asia. They're a trading society. They need to cooperate at a large scale. They live in diaspora communities. And the religion enables them to cooperate much better than without the religion. And the religion succeeds spectacularly purely in secular terms. Let me just tell you one story about what the ascetic Jains do. This is a tiny little piece of the story. But the Jains have to beg, the, the ascetics have to beg for food. And because their food restrictions are so severe, they could only accept food from the most devout Jain households. And the principle of non-action dictates they could only take a little bit of food from any household. And so what they spend their days doing is they go from household to household. And when they come in, they minutely inspect it for its purity. And they ask penetrating questions to the families, saying, have you done this? Have you done that? And only if they pass the test will they accept a little bit of food and leave with the food which is, which is publicly recognized by the entire community. And so the Jains are acting as a form of policing, policing the strength of the religious uh, um, adherence of the uh, community. And if you're an evolutionist, you know, if you study social insect colonies or other uh, highly cooperative uh, animal societies, you know that policing has a lot to uh, do with it. And that's just a little bit of the... Uh, a little bit of the story. And so against that background of thinking of religions as, a, as an enduring religion, as having great secular utility, as Emile Durkheim would have put it, let's think about liberal and conservative um, meaning systems. 
And um, this is based on uh, uh, a book called Sec uh, Sacred and Secular by two social scientists named Pippa Norris and Ronald Engelhardt and some work that I've done with my uh, former graduate student, Ingrid, uh, um, Ingrid uh, uh, Storm. And, so, and what this research shows is that basically liberal and conservative belief systems are like cultural species adapted to environments in which one of the environmental axes is existential uh, security. So what is existential security? It is the safety and stability of one's environment, at least as subjectively uh, perceived. Uh, if you live in Scandinavia and Australia, uh, you live in a safe, secure environment. You can expect to live to a ripe old age. You can expect to be highly educated. Uh, you can wait until you get married, until your mid-20s or late 20s. You can have a small number of children. Life is good. And so you can experiment. You can try new things, and if they fail, if the consequences are not too dire, there's not a strong need for collective action. And so that is the niche for uh, liberalism in both its religious and non-religious uh, formulations. Uh, if, uh, think of the Middle East for an existentially insecure environment. Not only do you no not know how long you'll survive, your entire culture is threatened. Society has a very poor infrastructure. Even if you wanted to get educated, it would be hard to. And um, uh, strong need for collective action to pull together. And so this is the niche for uh, conservatism. Uh, this is a crude dichotomy. It really is an ecosystem out there. There's many species, many flavors of conservatism and, and uh, uh, liberalism. But this will do as a crude um, uh, dichotomy. And so I had the privilege of working with a large data set that was uh, compiled by a psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who's famous for his book Flow, uh, about peak psychological experiences. And he pioneered a technique called the experience sampling method, which involves outfitting people with uh, devices that page them, uh, signal them at random times during the day, and that prompts them to pull out a little booklet and record where they are, what they're doing, who they're with, and fill out a checklist of psychological states on numerical scales. And this method is very similar to the point sampling method in animal behavior research. It is as close as human research comes to uh, a field study in which basically instead of a, instead of a biologist following their animal around, uh, you're recording your own data at random um, times. So everyone in this data set is an American, a teenager, and a Protestant. In all of these respects, they're culturally uniform. But some are Episcopalians, let us say, or a, a denomination that's uh, well-known to be liberal. And others are Pentecostals, uh, let us say, well-known to be, to be uh, conservative. And this cultural difference uh, creates astonishing differences in how these teens respond to their environments. And the graphs that I'm about to show you, if you're a biologist, uh, you would recognize these graphs as norms of reaction. Okay? There's going to be an environmental axis on the, on the uh, uh, x-axis, a phenotype on the y-axis, and the line describes basically how you respond to your environment. Two lines that are different from each other are different beasts. right? And so these liberal and conservative youths are different beasts in terms of how they respond to their environments. They're not different species but they sure look like it based on their, uh, how they respond to their um, environments. And so on this graph, on the uh, x-axis, we have the question, this is a one-time survey item. Uh, do you think of yourself as a religious person? No, yes, somewhat, yes, very. And on the y-axis, uh, in my family, we express opinions even when they differ. That is a liberal virtue. If you are a liberal youth, the more religious you regard yourself, the more you subscribe to this value. If you're a conservative youth, the less you subscribe to this value. And so these different religious systems are just pulling the youth apart on this particular value. On the x-axis, in my family, I am the one to decide which friends I can spend time with, another liberal virtue. On the y-axis, do you feel stressed, usually feel stressed, as a one-time questionnaire item? If you're a liberal and you can't decide which uh, your own friends. You are stressed. If you have elbow room, you are less stressed. Even at your most mellow, you are more stressed than the average conservative who does not require elbow room. 
So isn't this interesting? If you don't know much about conservative religions, you might well think that conservative youth spend a lot of their time quaking in fear that they're going to hell and the rapture is going to come and they're not going to, not going to float up into the, uh, into the uh, air. Could be true. But this data tells us otherwise. And what's happening in those belief systems is that fear is a very important part of that belief system, but it chases you into a place where you feel safe. And so the average time that you're signaled, you're, you're feeling pretty good, and you don't have the world on your shoulders. Whereas if you're a liberal, you've got to figure all the stuff out for yourself. That is the burden of being a, a uh, liberal. Well, we're the only people in the world who can construct time budgets for liberals and conservatives, just as an ecologist would construct a time budget. And what this graph shows is that liberal American teenagers spend a lot more time alone than conservatives. And if you now divide up the data, so you look at the psychological state when you're alone or uh, with somebody else, you get these astonishing differences. And so here we have, uh, this is now the beeper data, so you're now being signaled eight times a day at random, and you're asked, are you bored or excited? And we also know, are you alone or not alone? If you're a conservative youth and you are alone, you go slack. And then you come to life in the presence of others. If you're a liberal, you could give a damn. It doesn't matter whether you're alone or with someone else. So liberals have internalized their values in a way so that they can make their decisions and whatever it is that, that governs their feeling state is not dependent on the physical presence of others. Conservatives also internalized a bunch of stuff, but whatever it is, it is dependent on uh, the physical presence of others, and especially uh, family uh, members. Conservative youth love being with their family members, even though their family members don't make them feel special. There's questions like, you know, how special are you made to feel on your birthday? And liberals go overboard in making their kids feel special, special, special. But the kids don't reciprocate. <laughs> they, they don't really like being with their, their uh, uh, parents as much as the, uh, as much as the uh, uh, conservatives do. And so we can take this wonderful data that's on an individual experiential level, and we can expand the scale to a global scale. This is this book, Sacred and Secular. It's based on international comparisons including the World Value Survey, which is a survey that's been given worldwide and longitudinally, so that not only across nations, but the same nations um, over uh, a period of decades, so that we could get changes within nations in addition to um, cross-sectional data. On the x-axis, an index of existential security based on the Human Development Index. On the y-axis, an item on the World Value Survey about how important God is in your, in your uh, life, and we see this wonderful relationship. If you're a social scientist and you get data like this, you're happy. If you're a biologist, you're happy too. That's a nice, strong relationship. And this shows for all major religious traditions, Christianity is no different than Islam or Judaism or any of the major religious traditions in this respect, is that is this tight relationship between existential security and, in this case, the degree of secularism. That also goes for the particular variety of religion of uh, liberal and uh, conservative. And so now let's focus on community-based research. I've already said that uh, we're treating our city as a field site. I call it a whole university, whole city approach to community-based research. The whole university is this network of faculty and students that are all represent different disciplines but speak the common language of evolutionary theory. The whole city is an equivalent range of community partners, the school, the mayor's office, health, every aspect of the city. And this is another difference from the very beginning. It's very elementary, but it's worth pointing out that if community-based research, they're always complaining about what they call the silo problem. Every problem is studied in isolation, separate communities of researchers, separate funding sources. So if you're studying delinquency, or um, um, drug abuse, uh, different from each other. If you're an evolutionist, you are accustomed to studying, you are ready to study any trait in any species using the same theoretical and methodological toolkit. 
And so when an evolutionist starts to study their own community, they are prepared conceptually and empirically to study anything from prenatal care to elder care to gang violence to obesity, you name it, we're prepared to study it. And that turns out to be a radically different model of community-based research, starting at day one, even before you get a single um, result. And so, uh, um, in part because I have studied prosociality throughout my career as an evolutionist and a non-human species, then it was natural for me to uh, 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 study prosociality as a key part of the Binghamton uh, neighborhood uh, um, project. And so, uh, why is prosociality an evolutionary problem? Uh, as I've said, working on behalf of one's group requires time, energy, and risk on the part of individuals. That makes it vulnerable to the behaviors that we associate with cheating, exploitation, and free riding in all of their forms. And so Darwin understood this from the very beginning. If you put a polar bear with thin fur next to a polar bear with thick fur, the one with thick fur survives and reproduces better as an individual. If you put an altruist next to a selfish individual, the selfish individual does better. And so how can altruism evolve in the total population if it is locally disadvantageous wherever it occurs? Okay, that is the question. And the question actually has uh, quite a simple answer uh, by interacting primarily with other prosocial individuals. Prosociality is adaptive in biological uh, terms at a larger scale. Groups of prosocial individuals will manifestly survive and reproduce better than groups of non-prosocial individuals, even though prosociality is locally disadvantageous within each and every group. That, in a nutshell, is multi-level selection theory. And one of the tragedies of the history of evolutionary theory is that that idea became rejected and stigmatized in the 1960s. Such a simple idea became rejected and stigmatized in the 1960s and had to fight to come back into mainstream evolutionary uh, theory, a long and very interesting history. As it turns out, every evolutionary theory of social behavior includes the logic of multilevel selection within its own structure. And so uh, there's much to say there, but uh, that's uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, background. So on average, those who give must get. There must be a correlation between the prosociality of the individual and the prosociality of the individual's social um, environment. So this explains prosociality in nature. It explains the genetic evolution of prosociality, how we became, in genetic terms, a highly cooperative species, and also the facultative expression of human prosociality in everyday life. So how do we study in a city? We begin with a survey, and we go beyond surveys. Uh, my time here is short, but we now have many different uh, methods in which we validate the, uh, the survey results that I'm going to show you. These are very straightforward questions that we ask the public school students in the city. I think it is important to help other people and so on. I am serving others in my community. Uh, we get our bell-shaped curve. So uh, over here is, a, uh, here is a, uh, a budding Mother Teresa. And over here is uh, someone you probably might not want to meet on a dark <laughs> night. We also have the residential locations of these students, and all of this is passed through human subject review um, uh, guidelines. And so here's the city of Binghamton. There's two rivers that come together in downtown, the Susquehanna and the Shenango Rivers. There's uh, downtown Binghamton right there. And based on the magic of uh, geographical information systems technology, uh, we can create uh, maps such as this. Ignore the points for the moment. What you see is our rugged, Hills and valleys, dark hills and light valleys, these are not geographical hills and valleys. These are hills and valleys of prosociality. These are neighborhoods in which the average student is high versus low in prosociality. So not only are there individual differences, but there's neighborhood differences. There's extreme, small scale heterogeneity in the prosociality of the uh, youth. The uh, points are the locations of churches in the city of uh, Binghamton. Wouldn't it be interesting if every church was sitting on a peak of pro-sociality? That is not the case. Actually, we shouldn't expect it to be the case. But we have now funding from the Templeton Foundation, the same foundation that gave birth to the Templeton
surprise to study religion and spirituality in all of their variety in a human population the size of a city. And so we will be generating GIS maps of uh, the different varieties of religion and spirituality as part of this, um, as part of this um, project. So, of course, we have all sorts of other variables, and we do uh, analyses. So aren't you lucky that I'm not going to go through this in detail? And so I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, take-home results. The most important one is that there is indeed a strong correlation between the prosociality of the individual and the prosociality of the individual's social environment. Statistically, those most likely to give are also those likely to receive. And it didn't have to turn out that way. Empirically, it was perfectly possible that I could take kids on both ends of that bell curve, and both of them, on average, could report having the same social report, uh, support. If that had been the case, I would have had a very difficulty explaining why the maintenance of these as social strategies in the population. As it turns out, uh, this basic requirement of that correlation between the individual and the individual social environment is met. If you're a highly prosocial kid in the city of Binghamton, you are bathed in social support with your family, your neighborhood, your school, extracurricular activities, and your church, statistically speaking, uh, has a positive effect on the individual's pro-sociality. Uh, now, for the biologists in the audience, you know Hamilton's famous um, rule has the term R in it, which is the coefficient of relatedness. And the original interpretation of the term R was the probability, if you're an altruist, and you're interacting with a relative, let us say a full sibling, then R is the probability that the, uh, that the recipient of your altruism shares your altruistic gene identical by descent. And that value is 0.5 if you are interacting with a full uh, sibling. Turns out that R can also be interpreted as a correlation coefficient, which enables us to compare it with the correlation coefficient that exists for uh, our kids in the city of Binghamton. And that R is 0.7. Now, every paper on human prosociality begins with the puzzle, how is it that our species is so cooperative with non-relatives, unlike most other biological species? When cooperation exists in, in non-human species, typically, not always, it is among genetic relatives. How is it the case that humans are an exception to that rule? And the answer is, they're not an exception when it comes to what counts, the phenotypic correlation between the phenotype of the individual and the phenotype of the individual's social environment. Something other than genetic relatedness is causing this correlation to uh, take place, and that's maintaining prosociality. Well, it's actually maintaining the full spectrum in the, in the, uh, in the population. <clears throat> 